good morning, uh, blog viewers. Um, we are back from Germany, and uh, in honor today, we were, are wearing this uh, German uh, T-shirt. So uh, <clears throat> we did have a great time there, and I would encourage everyone to um, make a trip to Europe uh, as soon as possible. It is a wonderful uh, continent. Uh, Sweden, I went to Sweden as well. That was uh, wonderful as well. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I know, let me just make sure this is working. Um, I know we're, um, the readership and viewership is increasing, and uh, I know people are um, coming to the blog at different times, and it's sort of, um, uh, we really haven't uh, uh, described the project in as much detail as, uh, as I would hope. <clears throat> so today I'm going to start out by just kind of describing what we're doing here. Um, in a little bit more detail than I have before for some of the new new readers, um, so everyone knows what's going on. Um, the blog project here is um, to take uh, what I consider maybe the the key 15 to 20 uh, key virtues in life, the key things that sort of determine uh, how well a human life will go, um, and to try to uh, get as much precision as possible on what those terms mean. Um, and what they don't mean, um, and how um, how each of the terms and how the practice of each of those virtues in the right way can um, make our lives better as humans. Um, what the blog is not interested in is obviously any question of politics and specifically, or how someone can become a better um, a lawyer or a doctor or eye banker or a businessman. Those are all questions way outside the blog, but the, this, the blog is devoted to um, coming up with ideas and refining ideas and understanding ideas that relate to how it is to be, uh, to, that relate to how we can um, define each of these virtues in our own ways individually uh, for our individual lives and how we can practice those virtues in ways that make us um, a more, uh, uh, live a better life as a human being. Uh, again, not as a banker or, or as a husband or a father, but really um, strictly as a human being. Uh, what, what is good for us as a human being and what is not? And I think the best way to do that is to look at, in my view, three um, of the humanities uh, disciplines that have uh, wrestled with this issue the most um, uh, continuously, and those are philosophy and uh, literature and psychology. And I think... Uh, as I started to do this, I was obviously always drawn uh, pretty heavily toward philosophy, but I think um, it, it's, it's helpful to have uh, literature and psychology as well. They each add different perspectives um, to the, the definition of the virtue. Uh, philosophy is often very abstract, uh, general. Um, it it uh, purports to be valid to, uh, to all people in all places, um, the truths that it's coming up with, the conclusions. Uh, but it's it's very abstract. Literature obviously goes very specifically into individual characters and individual details of people's lives, and so in literature the details are the most important things I think. Uh, and uh, uh, you get the details uh, in a sense you don't get in philosophy. You know, philosophy you're still on the very high level of abstract rational principles, but in literature you get you see how uh, those principles start to play out. Uh, in a character's life um, and, and what it means uh, in a very complex way with the character. Um, then finally, of course, psychology, you get sort of a scientific dimension to it. And of course, the discipline that's probably um, the newest of these three and is making the most uh, probably original contributions at this point. And psychology, um, you know, studies and, and considers hundreds of human beings uh, and, and their individual problems and uh, what it is that uh, uh, is good for a person and uh, what is bad for a person and sort of examines all of those things and with, the, with, uh, with the scientific aspect and is intended to thera uh, provide some sort of therapy, uh, which is, again, one of the things here to the extent that our lives are not conducive or promoting um, the good for us as human beings, then we have to engage in some sort of therapy of the soul, therapy of, of, of uh, who we are, uh, make the necessary adjustments. Uh, all of us have things that we need to work on, I think. Uh, there's no one that has uh, figured out what it is to be um, you know, a great human being completely 
we're all working on it. It's all a, uh, it's an ascent, it's a climb toward more perfection and, and betterment. And uh, in this respect, I totally disagree with the assertion that just because, um, you know, that the, the, the attempt to um, uh, live an ideal life or pursue an ideal um, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is worthless. It shouldn't be pursued because it has, uh, you will never reach the ideal. Uh, we've talked about in other posts, of course, there's dangers to pursuing an ideal too aggressively. Uh, that's, uh, that's obvious. We saw that in the past couple posts. But that doesn't mean that once we, we shouldn't form ideals of how our lives should go and we shouldn't do everything we can to minimize the gap. There's always going to be a gap, I think, between um, the ideals of our lives and the actual practice. There's never going to be a person whose ideals and actions on a minute-to-minute -minute basis throughout their entire life matches up with um, uh, their ideals. Uh, so there's a gap, but I think um, it, does, um, it does behoove us to do everything we can to, uh, within reason, again, within our capabilities, within our circumstances, within our lives, uh, particular lives, to narrow that gap uh, as best we can. So um, that's sort of the blog project. Um, as I've been talking to some people and getting more feedback, some questions have been coming up that I want to address quickly. Um, do you, are the blogs posts intended to uh, analyze the entire book that we're studying? No, no, it is not enough space. If I wanted to write, if, for example, in discussing the Republic or Aristotle's Ethics, you know, I would probably could write three books on those works. Um, but the, I'm trying very hard to make the blog post 1,500 words or less because I think beyond that it's going to be hard uh, for people to follow it. And it probably is already difficult. So, um, no, you don't have to read the entire book. The blog posts are not even written um, to be an analysis of the works. What they do is they take the works and study them from the perspective of the, one of the goods that we're talking about, one of the human virtues, and try to glean some sort of wisdom out of it. Try to try to use it as a springboard to further thought and to further um, uh, uh, honing in on what these virtues mean. Um, so in that sense, there's really no need to analyze the whole work because um, yeah, we've already, uh, just in, this, in the post or the sections we're quoting from, We've already gotten enough out of the post or out of the work to um, start to define or to start to have some idea of what the uh, virtue it is that we're talking about, what it is that um, uh, it could relate to. So, um, so in that sense, no, there's no need to read the entire books. Uh, if you want to, you certainly can. I encourage you to do that, but there's no need to, uh, to do that. The posts are standalone. Uh, they do not require um, understanding of the whole work, and they're not intended to be an analysis of the whole work. Um, Comments. Uh, I would love comments, um, particularly, in fact, not comments to say, oh, you know, I think you're doing a great job with this, or thank you for doing this blog. What I really need and would love to have is comments uh, that are critical, um, because uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, anyone can benefit from uh, uh, more and more reflection on his ideas. Uh, I think Nietzsche said it very well when he said that, you know, intellectual courage is not just having ideas, but it's 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 uh, it's, it's having the courage to withstand the attack on the, those ideas. Uh, and so, um, uh, allow you don't need to attack me. Um, I would greatly appreciate um, uh, feedback uh, that is uh, intended to um, sort of take a, take the blog to another level. Um, and I would uh, encourage everyone to do that. And again, you don't need to read the entire work. You can just respond to. Um, uh, you know what I've uh, what I've written, and any feedback you know is, is good. Uh, you know, even if it's you know I don't quite understand this, or, or I don't I don't agree with you because of these reasons. I would I would love that. So, um, moving on to the um, oh one one last thing, uh, the quotes at the beginning. I put three or four quotes. Um, if it makes more sense um, to you, I, I know sometimes I've, I've heard from some people that it's sort of jarring to go straight into the quote. Um, I've tried to select quotes that people can understand uh, without reading the, the whole book. Um, but if it makes more sense to you, um, just start with the posts that I'm writing and uh, return to the quotes at the end. That might, that might have a, uh, it might make more sense after there's been a little bit more discussion there. So, um, so that's, that's it for um, remarks today. Today we're going to talk about, um, uh, and this is going to go under practical wisdom. And uh, this is, um, how is it, um, 
uh, how is it that we can get the right mix of, uh, of activities in our life? Uh, of course, that's one of the most important things when you think about uh, how a human life goes. Is what, is, what, is the, what is the proper mix of activities uh, that we should pursue? Um, uh, especially given that uh, as we grow, um, we, tend to be uh, we tend to gravitate toward one or two or three uh, things that we really, really love. Um, and that's a good thing. We talked about this in previous posts. Uh, having a sense of joy as to something you're doing is very important. Um, uh, maintaining that joy is very important. And, uh, and so there is, in some sense, there's a huge benefit from um, uh, enjoying uh, and, and really pursuing a set of activities in your life. Uh, it's critical to, uh, to your self-preservation because you're finding things that you find enjoyable in life. And you're doing them... Um, uh, as a sort of a way of being and a way of, uh, uh, you know, contributing to the world and to the human race even. Um, and this, these are all great, great things. Um, but on the other hand, the question is, um, as we change over the course of our lives or as, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, certain as we go through the activity, how do we know if we have the right mix uh, of the three or four activities and how do we know if we shouldn't broaden the, 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 the mix, uh, uh, throw in more into the mix of activities than we already have? Uh, what is it, uh, how is it we can get to know that? And uh, how, is it, uh, how is it we can know if the activities that we really are enjoying and doing the most uh, regularly are, are good ones for us? And uh, today we'll turn again to, um, to Aristotle. Um, section of his uh, key work on, on uh, ethics, uh, the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, uh, chapter 10.7 of the book. It's toward the end of the book. And uh, this is really a really a central passage in all of philosophy, and certainly in Aristotle's thought, um, a central passage uh, that, you know, in all of human thought, I would say, um, probably one of the top 20 or 30 um, sections uh, of any work. Um, T.S. Eliot once said that, uh, you know, there's just some authors and books that every one of us uh, at some point or other should go through. And I think this is certainly a passage that we, we all should wrestle with and try to understand as much as possible. Um, it comes near the end of Aristotle's ethics. Um, his ethics is one of his most mature works. Uh, at that point, he had spent hundreds, uh, you know, um, uh, he had written, I think, hundreds of books, many of which were not preserved. Um, but... Uh, but had written, you know, all about human life and, and uh, biology, and psychology, um, philosophy, um, throughout many dif different disciplines. And he, this was really considered, um, you know, sort of the capstone of his work. And in this section of, of the Nicomachean Ethics, he's talking about happiness. Uh, so he's talking about something um, that we all care about very deeply. Um, and he's talking about not only happiness, but what is the best form of happiness that is available for uh, human beings. Um, we could hardly deny that happiness is sort of one of the number one things that everyone um, is very interested in uh, as a way of life. Uh, it's, it's sort of, we all have the choice just not to go out and do anything every day. We could just sit at home um, sleeping all the time and doing nothing. So uh, the point of action in the world, Aristotle thinks, the, the reason we don't just do nothing all the time and the reason we go out in the world and do things is because we want to be happy. We're, we're pursuing our happiness and going out in the world and doing things. Um, but of course, how do we know that what we're doing is going to make us happy? What is it, um, what is it that uh, the things that we pursue, um, how, how can we know that they're actually making us happy? How can we um, know that we're choosing the right objects, the right uh, mix, of, uh, mix of activities, to, to increase our happiness. Um, and so that is the question that he wrestles with. Um, and of course, I think we've written about in pre previous posts, he's talking about happiness, not in terms of the happiness of a moment or a day or a month, but he's talking about what are the, what are the activities that are most likely to make us happy over the course of an entire life? Uh, that's the question. There's a lot of things that can make you happy for an hour, for uh, uh, six months, for, uh, you know, maybe two, a year or two. But after that, it, they don't make you happy anymore. That's, that, you know, you sort of 
um, gone through or take max down on whatever happiness that activity was going to give you. So Aristotle's wrestling with what is the what is the activity that can give you the most happiness over the course of a life and can be most continuous. And uh, let's just turn right now to the um, to the passage now. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he says, and this is section ten seven of the Ethics. Uh, I'm just going to read two uh, two paragraphs of it. Now, if happiness is a working in the way of excellence. Of course, that excellence must be the highest, that is to say, the excellence of the best principle, whether then this best principle is intellect or some other, which is thought naturally to rule and to lead and to conceive of noble and divine things, whether being in its own nature divine or the most divine of all our internal principles, the working of this in accordance with its own proper excellence must be the perfect happiness. So he had said earlier in the ethics that happiness is the is a working of the soul in accordance with virtue. Um, people are happy over the course of an entire life to the extent that they um, uh, practice these various virtues in their lives. It not just philosophize about them. He's very key on that. Uh, it's not just about talking about the virtues. It's about um, putting them into practice over the course of a life. I think he says uh, uh, some people, you know, flatter themselves in thinking that. Just by philosophizing about the virtues, they're becoming virtuous. But he says, no, that's not enough. Because just as when you go to a doctor, you can't just listen to the doctor um, uh, tell you, uh, you know, how you're going to get better and expect to get better. You have to actually do those things. And so um, here he comes back to that notion and says, if happiness is a working, again, it's a, it's a, it's a working, it's activity, happiness is activity toward virtue, then it then it stands to reason, he says, that um, the best happiness, the highest happiness, is in accordance with the best working or the best virtue. That's the argument he lays out very quickly. So logically, um, if there are uh, different virtues, and we can rank the different virtues, um, then the highest happiness is pursuing the highest virtue, or the best virtue. Um, and over the course of a complete life. So already there, we may, we may have some questions and say, well, how can you rank the virtues? How can you rank the excellences of life? Um, things are just different, maybe. Uh, you know, humility is a different virtue than moderation, than courage, than intellectual wisdom, than love, than beauty. Can you really... Is it really possible to, um, you know, say uh, that certain excellences are higher than others? They're all excellent. Um, so that might be an initial reaction we would have there. But then he goes on to sort of define what he thinks is um, the highest excellence, the highest uh, happiness, the highest excellence that produces the highest happiness. And then I want to read another paragraph, uh, and I'll try to read, this is the key section. Um, and I'll try to read this very slowly. He says that the highest happiness, um, the highest excellence is um, contemplative study. Um, and that, you know, uh, reading, uh, philosophizing about uh, subjects that are sort of abstract in form. I think he gives the example of science, like physics, mathematics, philosophy. Um, but in general, a, a contemplative life, a life where, a life of the mind, a life where you're not reading just for the sake of, um, you know, uh, gaining skills for the workplace, but reading for the sake of reading, reading for the sake of intellectual betterment, uh, refining your ideas, intellectual ideas about the world, yourself and others. Um, he says that's the best kind of life. Um, that's the most, that's the best excellence, that's the best virtue, and therefore he then concludes that it's the best life uh, uh, and, uh, over a complete life. Um, in support of this argument, he says um, uh, various things. Uh, he says that the contemplative life, um, as compared to all other lives, um, is, uh, is, uh, is what the gods do. Uh, he says uh, we can't imagine the gods doing um, anything other than contemplating. It, would make, it wouldn't make much sense for them to be engaged in commerce or business or pursuing sensual pleasures or um, any of those things. 
um, we can only kind of imagine the gods doing um, uh, contemplative study or philosophizing. Um, again, so that right there um, might be a problem with the argument. How, how can Aristotle know what the gods are doing? Um, it's hard to even, uh, no one knows what the gods are doing. And he, if you look at the text very carefully, he says that we picture the gods to be uh, engaged in contemplative study. We picture. Uh, so he doesn't know. He's, he's imagining that they do these kinds of things. But the gods might be doing many other things. Who knows? So uh, it's, an <clears throat> it's an argument already that we can see is not uh, foolproof. Um, in, in terms of uh, its support. But he goes on and says, if he just had said that, it would not be a very good argument. But he goes on and says that there are certain things about the contemplative life that make it the best excellent. And he says the, 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 the reasons, some of the reasons are that you can do it alone. You don't need anyone else to contemplate. Uh, you can do it continuously. You can sit in a room or you can sit in a house for days upon days and just think. Just think and think and think. Uh, for it, ad infinitum. Um, you don't need anyone else to do it, really. Um, you just need books. Uh, I guess he would need to go out, you know, go to a bookstore and buy stuff. But, but more or less, you don't need anyone to do it. Um, and it's done for its own sake. You're not doing it for the sake of money or, or anything else. You're doing it for the sake of, you just think it's a good activity. It's just good for you, good for your soul, good for who you are to, to engage in this kind of contemplative study. Uh, even if nothing else comes from it. Um, and he says there's a lot of pleasure involved in it, uh, this kind of life. It's a pleasure that, um, uh, you know, attaches to contemplative study that uh, would not be found in, in uh, many other uh, sorts of activities. And it's a pleasure that more or less is continuous. Uh, as you continue to contemplate, there's more and more pleasure that it increases your enjoyment of the activity. Um, uh, so there we can also say, well, what is it, why is it that things that uh, we can do alone and continuously for their own sake, uh, why would those be the uh, criteria of uh, why contemplative study is the best kind of life? Why does that really prove that that's the best kind of life? It, it, it may. Uh, there's definitely some attributes. That there's, is, it's a good thing to be able to do things on your own and, and continuously and uh, for its own sake. None of these are bad things. But I'm not sure it proves completely that um, doing contemplation uh, above all things is the best kind of life and that we should do it continuously. Um, uh, there may be uh, other activities that have different sort of characteristics that are better. Uh, they have better characteristics, uh, for one of which is to help other people and assist other people with their problems, um, you know, which is not included in the contemplative life at all, because uh, you're contemplating alone. That's the key virtue of the contemplative life. You, you're doing it alone. You're doing it for its own sake, not to help anyone else. Um, you're doing it because uh, um, there's pleasure involved in it. So it's a very isolated um, view of what is, what is uh, best for a human being. Um, of course, but he goes on and says um, in, the next, in the next section that even though he thinks this life is the best life, um, but such a life will be higher than mere human nature because a man will live thus not in so far as he is man, but in so far as there is in him a divine principle. And in proportion as this principle excels his composite nature, so far does the working therefore excel that in accordance with any other kind of excellence. And therefore, if pure intellect as compared with human nature is divine, so too will the life in accordance with it be divine compared with man's ordinary life. Yet must we not give ear to those who bid one as man to mind only man's affairs, or as mortal only mortal things. But so far as we can, make ourselves like immortal, and do all with a view to living in accordance with the highest principle in us. For small as it may be in bulk, yet in power and preciousness it far more excels all the others. There's a lot going on there, so I'm going to um, read through it. Um, very slowly. So he says, but such contemplation as a sort of an act or a, a life where you're contemplating continuously is, is above sort of what a human can do. You know, a human, um, a man will live thus, not insofar as he's a man, but insofar as there is in him a divine principle. So a, a, 
ordinary human life cannot be structured in a way that you can contemplate all the time. There's too many other things to do. Because by virtue of the fact that you are not a god, you're a human. So you have all these things you have to take care of. You have to take out the trash. You have to pay your taxes. You have to brush your teeth. You have to um, eat. You have to, um, you know, um, do a million things just to take care of your basic needs. Then above that, he says elsewhere in the ethics that friends are very important. So, of course, you can't do anything alone because you need to have friends. Um, so that, that uh, aspect of it would not work as well. Um, and so on and on and on, we can start adding up all the other things we have to do in our lives. Go to the gas station, fill up our gas tank. Um, uh, just endless. Buy, buy health insurance. Go to the doctor for our checkup. I mean, there, there is a list of probably 200 to 300 things that uh, sort of on a daily basis we have to do. Uh, or close to a daily basis, just by virtue of the fact that we're human. So he says, a man cannot live this way. You cannot do even this perfect activity continuously that you really enjoy. And that is really, you know, for Aristotle, he thought that was the best excellence. Um, but he says that even though it's the best excellence, it's, it's not a life for a human being. That's a key point. Because a human being has so many other things he has to do. Uh, can't just spend all of his time on one thing, even if that's the best thing for him. Best activity does not mean that you should do it all the time, um, because you're a person and you have a lot of things you need to take care of. But then he says, he's, this passage veers so many ways, but then he says, but to the extent that this act of contemplation is divine and is sort of the best thing that a human being can do, we should, um, we should do it as much as we can. Um, because um, it's the best thing. Uh, so we have to take care of our human needs, but we should structure our life, he says, um, so that we can do this thing as much as possible. He, uh, I think the, the key here is, he says, we shouldn't listen to people that say um, that since you're a human being, you should only care about um, your human affairs, you know, basically your, your, what your, uh, your day-to-day needs. You shouldn't just care about your day-to-day needs as a human. Um, but you should strive after the life of the intellect because that is a, a divine, blessed. Of course, these are translations. I don't think he means exactly godlike, but this, there's something blessed, there's something wonderful, there's something uh, perfect about this activity, and you should do everything you can in your life to arrange your life with a view to living in accordance with this back, best activity. But so, he says, but so far as we can, so far as we can, make ourselves like immortals, and do all with a view to living in accordance with the highest principle in us. For small as it may be in bulk, yet in power and preciousness, it far more excels all the others. So we should structure our lives, make decisions to allow us to engage in contemplative study, this best activity Aristotle thinks, more than any others. Um, so the, the, the principle is that if there's a best activity, and we've uh, figured out what the best activity is for us, we should structure our lives, beyond, you know, um, taking care of our basic needs, but to allow us to do that activity the most we can, not continuously because we've got all our human needs, but to the, to the greatest extent we can. Now, that is sort of the argument that I want to now um, focus on. Um, uh, I think um, to some extent, and everyone can do that. You know, we don't, there's limits to um, how much time everyone has, or um, what, uh, what interests people have, but everyone can, can um, engage in, in contemplation. Um, it, it, there's no limit to uh, how, many, how many degrees you need to do it and stuff. You can, you can structure your life in a way that you have time to contemplate. Um, that's not an issue. But um, uh, what's more interesting is um, sort of the, some of the arguments that fall out from that. Um, if there is some best activity eat, Let's think about this for a second. Um, whether it's golfing, biking, skiing, practicing law, yoga, doing philosophy, blogging, whatever it is, should we do that thing forever? That's sort of the interesting argument, I think, that comes out of all this. Because um, no one in today's age, no one really believes that you should contemplate forever or that it's divine. Um, uh, you know, and that's not really an argument that's going to go very far. 
But what's interesting in the argument here is if there is some best activity, whatever it is, uh, that we enjoy, uh, let's take uh, golfing, should we do that thing forever? Well, no, because again, we've got all the um, thing, all our human needs and, and all the things we have to do as a human to take care of. Uh, we can't play golf while you know relatives are sick and need us, or we can't play golf while um, you know, uh, you know, our child is, uh, we need to pick up our child from school. Uh, so there's limits. So we have to structure our lives uh, in a way that we do this while taking care of all of our other activities. Um, but even beyond that, uh, this is not really a controversial idea. Still, I don't think this is controversial because no one, no one does one thing all the time. People are always doing a mix of things every day. And no one is um, uh, continuously golfing or continuously skiing. Um, so that's, that's less of the interesting argument. Um, what is more interesting is um, uh, should we structure our lives in the same way that um, Aristotle says with contemplation? Should we structure our lives around one activity? Um, this would make more sense because at least we're still now um, accepting that we're not going to do the activity continuously, but, uh, but that we're going to try to do it as much as we can given our human, uh, human nature. Um, is there some, uh, is there some, uh, if there is some best activity, should we structure our lives so that we can do it as much as possible? Now that, that again has the, the benefit that it's, it's, it provides joy to you. It's, it's, uh, it's good for you to, to do an activity that you find very pleasing and, and enjoyable. But again, on the other hand, we could always be wrong about the activity, just as Aristotle um, could have been wrong on his argument on contemplation. There was, Various things we pointed out in the argument that didn't make a lot of sense. He's, he was st started out by saying that these are the, a life of contemplation is what we imagine the gods doing. Um, that's how we imagine the gods living. We picture the gods, but he didn't know. He couldn't have known. So um, his argument could have been wrong. Uh, and then the activities and the, the, the reasons he said that, that life was the best kind of life, uh, doing it continuously alone, um, you know, it had its own pleasures. He could have been wrong on all those points. Um, and so, uh, he could have been right too, but, but uh, he could have been wrong on all those points. So, um, we could always be wrong on the, the best activity we choose to structure our lives around. And that's an important point. Uh, so, if we're wrong on the best activity, uh, uh, that's not good for us. Uh, because we've now structured everything around an activity that's not the best activity for us. And, uh, and that's not good for us as a human being. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, what, um, uh, what, what's important here is um, uh, we should always determine if that's uh, practically um, looking at our activity and seeing if it's serving the concept that we've brought up many times, the, the organic good of life. If it's serving the, the things that many people um, would regard as good from culture to culture. Um, things like, uh, you know, um, rest, relaxation, um, enjoying a beautiful song, enjoying a nice day in the park, friendship with others, um, various forms of sensual pleasures, all these things that people just instinctively know are good. Um, are those activities, or is this, is this best activity that we're doing, is it serving those, those purposes? And if it's not, then it's not, the, uh, it's not serving the organic human good for us. That we should we should make a change, um, and so um, uh, we should always I think uh, beyond this um, uh, look at those that, that activity that we've structured structured our life around, and uh, and make sure that it is serving um, it, that it is the best activity, and always know that we could be wrong on on whatever activity we've chosen as as the sort of organizing principle, um, and that again requires us to look. Uh, at our activities closely, um, be honest with ourselves, and uh, and have integrity as to uh, what we're trying to do, uh, and if it's if it's actually serving the good for us or if it's not, uh, and that's not something we can do alone, but it's also something that uh, requires sort of practical wisdom, uh, which is uh, of course Aristotle. Uh, in, in other posts, we'll talk about this. Practical wisdom was for him a very important virtue beyond uh, the intellectual virtues, but practical wisdom, knowing what, how to um, make proper decisions in life as to
day-to-day -day affairs was a very, very important uh, idea in his mind. So um, that is, uh, that is uh, I guess, what we could say about that second argument. Now, moving even beyond that, uh, I think the most interesting uh, and the most um, uh, sort of controversial idea among all of these is, uh, is and again, this starts with the uh, uh, sort of understanding that no one does one activity. Uh, uh, no one really even structures their life around one activity. It's usually two or three or four or five activities. No one just, uh, very few people structure their life just to golf or ski. It's usually that and uh, two or three or four other things. That it's a common uh, activity set, you could say, that people engage in. Let's say someone does skiing, reads philosophy, um, works as a doctor, and um, uh, is a father. So those are the four, let's say, dominant activities of his life. Um, what's really interesting is thinking about um, whether we should structure our lives around a set of three or four activities. Um, and, and, of course, take care of all the other just as we've been talking about uh, with the other uh, arguments so far, do everything we take all take care of all our basic human needs, but really focus on, go for, care about these three or four activities. Um, is that a good way to go? Well, I think like Aristotle tried to do, if that's what we're going to do, we should um, have some reasons for why we think these are the three or four best activities for us. Aristotle at least made an attempt in the ethics to come up with why he thought contemplation was the best human activity. He at least came up with arguments. Um, some of them were good, some of them weren't. But at least he had worked out in his mind why those activities were so good. Um, and he had tried to give reasons for them. Um, and so I think we should do the same thing. If we're structuring our life around three or four activities, we should figure out and determine why is it these three or four activities are the best ones for us, or are there some other activities we should mix in, um, uh, sort of dominant activities we should mix in, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, one time or two times try something, but but uh, you know, for example, with the with the with the guy that was doing skiing, philosophy, um, was a doctor and was a father, um, community service, that's sort of a dominant activity. Should he throw that into the mix? Um, he would have to think about that. Um, but at least um, he should think about the various other activities uh, that he's pursuing so earnestly. What is it that's good about those activities? And why is it that this is the best life he can come up with to go for these three or four things and basically everything else just sort of do, just to do those three or four things uh, continuously uh, in his life. Um, and so that is, uh, I think to me, that is the most interesting argument that comes out of all of this is uh, Whatever set of basic commitments we have as to activities, usually three, four, five, I would say, probably for most people no more than that, uh, does it make sense? Have we figured out what's good about those activities and, wh and, and why they're good for us to do them so continuously over the course of a life uh, from, let's say, age 25 to um, basically till we die? Uh, why those three or four activities are the best ones? And uh, look at it continuously because as, as we change, they, they may not be the best ones for us anymore because we're constantly changing, constantly uh, becoming different people, constantly reacting to different things, experiencing different things, learning new things, um, experiencing different visions of the world. Um, so in that sense, we should think about uh, adding another activity, uh, dominant activity, and why, and to the mix. And if so, why? And if not, why not? Do we think we've got the, the perfect mix already? And, uh, and if so, why? If not, uh, let's think about what, what to add. So, um, uh, uh, and then of course, always, just as with the other arguments, we have to realize we could be wrong on, on the mix that we selected. Always, um, we should think about uh, uh, making changes to the, to the mix if, if it's not proper, if it's not working out for us. Um, that's, that's very important too. Um, so the last thought I guess I want to end with is, I guess all of this is somewhat messy. There's no clear answers. Um, there's no clear practical rule, common sense rule that you can easily apply. Um, but it's, it's at least um, human life is just as messy, 
just as um, uh, incoherent sometimes and often and uh, unknown. So I think that the rules being so uh, untidy or unclean as this that we've sort of tried to lay out, um, it's, it's really as, as, as good as you can get in human life. Um, and I think that's sort of the perfect clarity that people are going to see. Uh, it's never going to be there. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't at least um, think things through, um, evaluate your core activities, your core commitments, figure out if those are the best ones, make changes along the way, uh, think about adding new activities uh, uh, as, you, as you change, getting rid of um, uh, prior things that really don't really mean much to you anymore. And I think in that respect, uh, uh, while not the most clearest solution, uh, it is definitely still a very powerful um, idea to take seriously and to work out. So with that, um, we'll conclude today's post. Thank you.